there are three authors who, in different reasoning contexts, speak about the difference, and they defend this difference, the difference between is and ought. The three authors are David Hume, the famous empiricist, George Edward Moore, a British moral philosopher, and the German social scientist Max Weber. They know that there is a difference between the grammar of descriptive sentences and the grammar of prescriptive sentences, and they affirm that there is no possibility of getting from an is to an ought. There is no possibility, in other words, of deriving oughts or inferring oughts from is. You cannot get from a description to a prescription. Such an entailment would not function logically. I will concentrate on Moore uh, and then Weber. Moore, in his Principia, Prin Prin Principia Ethica, Principia Ethica, affirms that the quality of being good cannot be defined. If you try to do that, if you try to define the property of being good or the property of goodness, you would have to reduce that property to a natural property. And in, at the moment you did that, you would commit the so-called naturalistic fallacy. Because you would identify what is primitive and what doesn't need a definition with something natural. For instance, the property of being beneficial, or the property of cause and pleasure, or the property of being advantageous in evolutionary terms. So you would eliminate the difference between is and ought if you tried to define good, reducing it to a natural property. In his effort to defend the ideal of objectivity for social sciences, the German uh, philosopher and social philosopher and sociologist Max Weber emphatically stresses the difference between value-related and value-guided. Scientific research has, according to Weber, to be value-free, and even if sociologists sometimes speak about values and to study how values function in a specific society, they should be value free, they should proceed value free, not being guided by values when they described things, they should do it neutrally. Weber was interested, of course, in justifying epistemologically the status of sociology as a science, and that could only be done uh, defending the ideal of objectivity of a value-free science. What I intend to do in this lecture is to show in an explanatory way that the phenomenon of normativity, the normative phenomenon, does not belong exclusively to the realm of ethics and moral theory. There are many different sorts of oughts and normative structures human beings are confronted with when they reason about reality, when they think, reasoning and proposing arguments, and when they act and uh, decide. In other words, normativity is not only present in the ethical and practical realm, or in the political realm, but also in logical arguments and inferences, and in the real world physics describes and explains. In this world, in the empirical world, physics tries to understand and to explain, there are indeed uh, variations and covariations that manifest natural oughts and conditions for all those who want to understand and explain it, for all those who want to understand and explain what there is and what happens. If we want to analyze the, the different kinds of or sorts of oughts that, are, that there are, or the different uh, oughts human beings are confronted with, it is sensible to analyze the many 
odd sentences, we use daily in our natural languages. We use some odd sentences in a prescriptive way and other odd sentences in a predictive way. Odd sentences can indeed express a prescription or they can express a prediction. Only the context will show which is meant. Take, for instance, the sentence, if one is tired or if one is exhausted, one ought to take a rest. Such an odd sentence would be an example of a sentence expressing a prescriptive recommendation. And if you take the other sentence, if one takes a rest, one ought to wake refreshed, you are confronted with a sentence, with an odd sentence, that expresses a justified prediction and is not a prescriptive sentence. If you take a rest, most probably you will wake refreshed after having done it. That's a rational expectation you can have. John Broom, who was moral philosopher at the University of Oxford, analyzing odd sentences, distinguishes owned and unowned oughts, qualified and unqualified oughts, and objective and prospective oughts. Ownership as a criterion to distinguish sorts of ought indicates agent relativity. Not owned thoughts, oughts do not mention anybody, so the sentence life ought not to be so unfair. Oughts may be qualified as moral, rational or prudential oughts. The all things considered ought is the ought John Broom calls the central ought. Objective oughts uh, outcome oughts. There are situations where you ought to do what you will have, what will have the best consequences. Prospective oughts, on the other hand, present a portfolio of possible outcomes, each associated with a probability. Outcome oughts tell us what we ought objectively to do. Prospective oughts are relative to probabilities and expected values. So you see there are many sorts of odd sentences, prescriptive and predictive, owned and unowned, qualified and unqualified, uh, objective and, prospect um, and prospective. Similar to the odd sentences are the so-called requirements. Actually, requirements can be easily transformed into odd sentences. There are three sorts of requirements quality requirements, sources requirements, and needs requirements. Let me give you some examples. First, for property requirements. A staying healthy requires hard work. Staying healthy would be a property, and if you want to get that property, to realize that property in your own life, then you have to work hard. Writing scientific papers or creative papers requires determination. That would be also an example for a property requirement. For source re sources requirements, I've got two examples. The law requires something that we should do. The bill requires payment. And for needs requirements, I've got two examples too. Trees require water and the patient requires constant attention. Requirements can be easily translated into or transformed into odd sentences. The need requirement, trees require water, or plants require water, would be easily translatable into the sentence if you have to, good, to have a plant uh, then you have to water it. Or if you want to take care of the patient, then you should pay constant attention to the patient. So there are many sorts of odds. And now I'm going to show you how moral odds have been conceived of, 
what logical odds are, uh, what physical odds could be, and at the end I will ask the question whether we get from the odds reasons or whether reasons are to be identified with the odds we are confronted with when we think, when we try to understand the world, or when we act. Depending on the conception of ethics that you prefer, moral or ethical odds can be potential odds, deontological uh, odds, categorical odds, or hypothetical odds. In the history of Western philosophy, there have been three main approaches to the ethical realm. Virtue ethics, or Aristotelian ethics, the philosophy of a good life, deontological moral philosophy, and utilitarianism and consequentialism. For Aristotelians, ethical odds are prudential odds. What you ought to do in order to lead a good life, what you ought to do in order to acquire those habits that you need in order to lead that life, that is, what you ought to do in order to acquire certain practical virtues. For Immanuel Kant uh, and the deontological moral uh, philosophers, um, moral odds are always categorical odds. When reason determines the will, then is the will a good will in a moral sense, and what reason commands uh, has a categorical validity that cannot be relativized. Utilitarians and consequential consequentialists think hypothetically in ethical matters. They are interested in having good results, good results and good effects, beneficial effects from our actions, and therefore uh, the ethical odds they propose are always uh, hypothetical odds. Logical odds. When people reason, they make inferences leading them from certain statements, the so-called premises, to other statements, the conclusions. In logic, such inferences are called arguments. An argument is a group or system of statements standing in relation to each other. The argument's conclusion is derived from the initial statements that provide support and evidence. On the basis of this support and evidence, reasoners are led by logical necessity. Wittgenstein spoke about the logical mus, the logical mass, the logical odds force uh, are led by logical necessity to the conclusion. Logic deals with the relation between premises and conclusions, not with the truth of the premises. Logical correctness is completely independent of the truth of the premises. Some conclusions make explicit the content of the premises. Such conclusions are conclusions of deductive arguments. Other conclusions go beyond the information given in the premises, the conclusions of non-deductive, inductive or plausible arguments. But all arguments, the demonstrative, deductive arguments and the inductive or abductive or plausible arguments, require and force a transition to certain statements to the conclusions of the arguments. Logically reasoning, we are thus led by the so-called logical ought that forces us to accept or to, re or to reject certain statements. Existing things in the world have qualities and properties. Those existing things and entities exist always in relational or structural arrangements, not isolated or on their own, but structurally related, always in interaction with other existing things. Some of the properties and qualities of things are called dispositional. They are not directly detectable or observable, but in a specific situations and constellations, those dispositional properties of the entities of the world become manifest 
in such situations they cause something, they make things happen. And they do it as a consequence of their dispositional nature. Events occur then, changes take place. Dispositional vocabulary does not create what it describes. It is not arbitra arbitrary uh, terminology or arbitrary vocabulary, but a series of terms and concepts that are more or less appropriate depending on how responsive they are to what they intend to describe and explain. In a certain sense, dispositional vocabulary is bound, constrained, determined vocabulary, determined and constrained by physical odds that are the natural conditions and constraints we have to take into account when thinking, acting and deciding. Some animals have four legs and a tail. You could decide to call the tail a leg, but if you do that, you do not transform the tail into a leg, although it is a possible convention to speak about legs and tail using the same word. So, our descriptions of the natural world are bound by the properties, the entities and things have, the dispositional properties they have, that cause things to happen in the world. Oughts and reasons. It is evident that there are descriptions and prescriptions only because existing human beings do exist and describe what there is and what happens. And because those same human beings describing and explaining reality are confronted with constraints and conditions for their own thinking and acting. Such constraints and conditions are natural odds that deliver reasons for believing something or for doing something. Being interested in not multiplying entities without necessity, that would be the program of the nominalists, it would be more appropriate to speak of those constraints and conditions as our reasons to believe something or to do something. There are, however, authors who would not accept the identification of reasons with things or ordinary facts. Thomas Scanlon's position in his book Being Realistic About Reasons seems to me to be the right position. The sharpness of a piece of metal can be a reason for me not to press my hand against it. In Scanlon's own words, quote, the things that can be reasons are not a special kind of entity, but ordinary facts in many cases, facts about the natural world. For example, the fact that the edge of a piece of metal is sharp is a reason for me now not to press my hand against it." End of quote. In other words, nothing additional, nothing intelligible to be added to the fact is necessary for the fact to be a reason. Neither an inference, nor a special insight, nor a transformational validation, or a transfigurational transformation. The fact alone is, in the appropriate circumstances, the reason to do or not to do something. Not only facts of the world, but also our own experiences, what scientific communities believe and take to be true, what well-informed agents and qualified informants report can be a reason for us to believe something and many things can be for us a reason to do or not to do something. Facts of the world, states of affairs, events, norms, value judgments, rights other people may have, conventions, feelings and emotions, desires and preferences, goals, intentions and plans. Some of these reasons are good, others are perhaps better, others are worse, but you see, reasons are diverse and heterogeneous. And there is in fact no reason with a capital R. Uh, therefore, our reasons to believe something or our reasons 
to do something or to decide in a specific way are not reason's voice, as some uh, German idealists or German philosophers would like to put it. Uh, reasons are not die Stimme der Vernunft. Reasons are simply the best method we have to rationalize in a non-Freudian way what we believe and how we act.